So from ancient times, <clears throat> Jews and Christians have argued that the existence of God can be known from his works. That is, creation itself points to its creator. This is clearly stated in scripture as in the beginning of Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. The Old Testament book of wisdom, which I quoted in an earlier talk, says that from the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. This is echoed by St. Paul in his letter to the Romans, where he says that ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. The same theme is taken up by early Christian writers such as St. Irenaeus in the second century, who wrote, creation itself reveals him who created it, and the work made is suggestive of him that made it, and the world manifests him that arranged it. So what is it about the created world that reveals God? Most fundamentally, of course, is the very fact that the world exists at all. There is a universe, but there didn't have to be. So the very existence of the universe must have a cause, a cause of being, as I talked about in the last talk. This is the most fundamental fact about the world that points to its creator, but there's another fundamental fact about the world that also calls for explanation, and that is the fact that the world is orderly. To quote Saint Irenaeus again, there exists but one God. He is the Father, God, the creator, the author, the giver of order. This argument that the orderliness of the cosmos points to a God who is the giver of order is repeated over and over by the theologians of the early church. And to show how prominent this argument is in Catholic tradition, I'm going to quote from a number, I think eight, of these early authors, seven or eight. And I emphasize in the passages the words order, law, harmony, and beauty, which recur like a refrain. So as I quoted the other day, Minucius, oops, Minucius Felix, says, when you see providence, order, and law in the, uh, in the home of this world, in the heavens and on earth, believe that there is a Lord and author of the universe more beautiful than the stars themselves and the various parts of the whole world. God bless you. Origen, the great theologian Origen, writing around 250 AD, says, when we are convinced by what we see in the excellent orderliness of the world, then we worship its maker as the one author of one effect, which, since it is entirely in harmony with itself, cannot therefore have been the work of many makers. Lactantius, writing around 300 AD, says, there is no one so uncivilized, nor of such barbarous manners, that he does not, when he raises his eyes to heaven, understand something from the very magnitude of things, their motion, arrangement, constancy, beauty, and proportion, and that this could not possibly be if it were not established in wonderful order, having been fashioned on some greater design. Saint Athanasius, writing shortly after that, says, creation, as if in written characters and by means of its order and harmony, declares in a loud voice its own master and creator. He goes on to say, God, by his own word, gave to creation such order as is found therein, so that though he is by nature invisible, men might be able to know him through his works. St. Gregory of Nazianzus, in the late fourth century, writes, let us even suppose that the existence of the world is spontaneous. To what will you ascribe its order? St. Gregory of Nyssa, writing around the same time, says that all creation, and above all, as the scripture says, the orderly arrangement of the heavens demonstrates the wisdom of the creator through the skill displayed in his works. And finally, St. Cyril of Alexandria, writing in the mid-fifth century, says, 
from the origination of the world, from the fact that it has being, and from its order and beauty, we can recognize that the wisdom and power of him that, who created it and brought it into existence far surpasses every created mind. This, this argument is an example of what philosophers have traditionally called the argument from design for the existence of God. Unfortunately, in recent years, the word design has been taken over to a large extent by something called the intelligent design movement, or ID movement for short, which started in the late 1990s. Now, this movement uses a specific kind of design argument to attack Darwinian evolution. I won't discuss evolution in this talk here at all, except to say that the Catholic Church has never condemned evolution and does not oppose it. I do, however, want to point out three ways in which the ID movement's version of a design argument differs from the more ancient argument for a giver of order that we see in the passages I just quoted from early Christian writers. First, the ID movement looks for evidence of design only in phenomena that they think cannot be explained in a natural way. That is, in things that supposedly go beyond the capacities of nature. By contrast, the argument for a giver of order is based on the orderliness of nature itself. As I noted in my first talk, both scripture and early Christian writings generally cite perfectly natural phenomena as evidence of God because nature itself and its lawful order come from God. Second, the ID movement focuses ex almost exclusively on biological phenomena, and in particular on the structures of living things or parts of living things. One sees, however, that the ancient argument is based on the order of the whole cosmos, both living things and non-living things, both the earth and the heavens, all of creation points to its creator. Rather than the traditional emphasis being on biology, in fact, scripture and early Christian writers most commonly point to the heavens. Psalm 19 said that the heavens declare the glory of God. Minucius Felix extolled that providence, order, and law in the heavens and on earth. Lactantius referred to what we see, quote, when we raise our eyes to heaven. Saint Athanasius spoke of the orderly arrangement of the heavens and so forth, but again, it is all parts of creation for them that reflect the creator. Third, the ID movement focuses entirely on the complexity of things found in the biological realm, which they, order, they argue that certain things are so complex that evolution could not have produced them. But the central theme of the ancient Christian writings was the, not on complexity, but on the order, beauty, harmony, and lawfulness of the world. So to avoid being hung up on the word design and the baggage which it, that word has now unfortunately acquired, let's call the more ancient argument the argument from cosmic order. How has this argument from order held up in the light of modern science? I'm going to show you or argue that it is held up very well indeed. The discoveries of modern science cannot undercut it for the simple reason that all explanations in modern science are based on the premise, on the fact, that nature is orderly and lawful, which is also the premise of this argument from order. In fact, the discoveries of modern physics, by revealing cosmic order to be much more profound and impressive than had previously been imagined, have, enormous, have, have, if anything, enormously strengthened this ancient argument. The more we discover, the stronger it becomes. Modern atheists and materialists would disagree with this, of course. Their point, their point, is that if you look at the orderly shapes and arrangements of things that you see in the physical world, in the natural world, you find that they do not come from someone arranging them or shaping them by hand, so to speak, as is the case with human artifacts. 
Rather, they arise spontaneously through blind and impersonal natural forces and mechanisms. No organizing intelligence or giver of order is needed, they say. For example, if we see a human artifact that has a spherical shape, such as a billiard ball, we know that someone has chosen to give it that shape. But stars and planets are spherical, or very nearly so, because their gravitational, excuse me, their gravitational self-attraction squeezes them into spheres. If we see soldiers arranged in a regular array, like these World War I soldiers, I think they are, on a parade ground, or chairs arranged in a regular array in an auditorium, we know that this is due to human choice. Someone arranged them. But when liquids freeze, their molecules, which had been moving around randomly in the liquid, spontaneously arrange themselves into the regular arrays called crystals. Like these crystals, and these are actual snowflakes, and these crystals. Um, and this happens because of chemical forces. Or consider the very orderly structure of the solar system. That's an artist's conception. It's, all, it's not scaled correctly. The orbits of the planets, you can see, all lie more or less in the same plane. And they all go around the sun in the same direction. And the planets have elliptical orbits that are all quite close to being circles. So this isn't random and chaotic. This is highly orderly structure. These geometrical patterns were not imposed by hand. Actually, Newton thought they were. But these, by God directly doing that by hand, so to speak. But we know they're not imposed by hand. We know that the solar system started as a chaotically swirling cloud of gas and dust. And uh, that's what we believe today. And that its orderly structure emerged gradually through physical mechanisms that are well understood. We understand how this arose from the cloud of gas. And indeed, this seems to be the story of the universe. The whole universe in its early stages was filled with a nearly uniform, nearly featureless gas of particles and dust, of elementary particles. This gas grew more lumpy. There were slight, there's a very slight lumpiness in it due to quantum fluctuations about lumpiness, about one part in 10 to the four. And this lumpiness grew, was enhanced um, by gravitational self-attraction. And these lumps eventually condensed into ga uh, clusters of galaxies, galaxies, and then stars, and then planets. Somewhere on the surface of the Earth, there was a soup of simple chemicals, presumably. These chemicals clump together under the influence of electromagnetic forces into smaller and then larger molecules until, at last, molecules that could replicate themselves appeared. This is what people believe. This led eventually to the emergence of self-replicating cells and then ultimately to multicellular organisms. Then even more complex organisms with nervous systems and brains. So this is the grand picture. Order emerging spontaneously from chaos, form from formlessness. And presiding over the whole drama, the atheist tells us, is not some intelligence, but blind physical forces, gravity, electromagnetism, and so forth, and mathematical necessity. Now, while this account of cosmic history is correct as far as it goes, it's incomplete. It, the lessons the atheist draws from it are based on a superficial view of science. It is a view that really leaves out a major part of what science has taught us about nature, maybe the most important part. What it leaves out is this. 
When examined carefully, scientific accounts and explanations of natural processes are never really about order spontaneously emerging from mere chaos or form from mere formlessness. On the contrary, these accounts are always about the unfolding of a pre-existing deeper order, an order that was already present in the nature of things, although often in a hidden way. In physics, when we see situations that appear to be entirely amorphous or chaotic, automatically or spontaneously arranging themselves into intricate orderly patterns, whether, whether crystals or solar system, we find in every case that what, is a, what appeared to be entirely amorphous or chaotic actually had a great deal of order already built into it. I'm going to illustrate this with a simple but very, I think, very instructive example. And what we're going to learn from it is the following important principle. Order has to be already built in for order to come out. So here's the example. Let's imagine that we have a box with some ball bearings rolling around in the bottom of it. The ball bearings will roll around aimlessly and will tend to have a random pattern. But if we tilt the box a little, the ball bearings will all roll into one corner and we'll see a pattern emerge. And if you played those little games, you're trying to get the little ball bearings into the little pits, you just know that this happens. They roll into a corner and they end up looking like that. That pattern is what mathematicians call the hexagonal closest packing pattern. It's the tightest way to pack spheres together. Here are some examples of spheres packed in this way. Oranges at a fruit stand, insect eggs on a leaf. But let's go back to the ball bearings. As I said, they arrange themselves into this pattern when the box is jiggled a bit. They're not arranged one by one by an intelligent agent as were the oranges at the fruit stand. Why do they do this? They do it because of two things. First, the force of gravity is pulling them down into the corner of the box and squeezing them together, the force of gravity. And second, it is the mathematical fact that the tightest way to pack spheres is the hexagonal array. But let's think a little harder about what's going on. Suppose that instead of ball bearings in a box, I did the same thing to my living room. I hired a huge crane to come and tilt it and shake it so that everything slid into the corner. I would not end up with an orderly pattern but a jumbled heap of lamps, furniture, <laughs> books, toys, and so on. Now, I want to emphasize that this is not a picture of my living room. <laughs> Even when our five children were small, it never got quite this bad. But it illustrates the point. Why don't, we, why don't the ball bearings form a jumbled heap then? Part of the reason is that unlike the objects in that room, the ball bearings all have exactly the same size and shape. But that's not the whole story. Because after all, if I were to put a lot of identical spoons in the bottom of a box and shake it and tilt it, the spoons would still form a jumbled heap in the corner. If you look closely, you'll find these are not all identical spoons, but that's all right. That's what you would see. A, sec a crucial fact is that the ball bearings not only all have the same size and shape, but that the shape of a ball bearing is a particularly simple and symmetrical one, a sphere. In fact, the sphere is the most symmetrical three-dimensional shape possible because it look, a sphere looks exactly the same from any angle. So when the ball bearings fall into the corner, it doesn't matter very much how they fall. Spoons or furniture can po will point every which way, and that will look like a jumble. But spheres cannot point every which way, because a sphere, no matter which way it is turned, looks exactly the same. 
So that orderly pattern is, so that even before the box was tilted, and while the ball bearings were rolling around aimlessly and forming a rat of random patterns, looking chaotic, there were already at least two orderly features already present in the situation that every ball bearing had the same size and shape and as every other ball and that each ball bearing had the perfectly symmetrical shape of a sphere. So the order that emerged, that geometrical order that we see emerging in the hexagonal arrangement of the ball bearings was a consequence of some geometrical order that was already present in the shapes of the individual ball bearings, even when they were rolling around aimlessly, randomly. Not only that, but there were other more, less visible, more subtle, more abstract, but even more important principles of order already present and at work in that supposedly chaotic situation. Among these were the laws of gravity and mechanics, which are what caused the ball bearings to squeeze down into the corner. The ball bearings did this to minimize their gravitational potential energy. The laws of mechanics and gravity that are responsible for this are themselves ordering principles at a deeper, more abstract level. So when we see this, so, so what we see from this example is how order came from order. But it's even more interesting than that. As I'll now explain, the order that emerged was in a certain sense less than the order that was already there. Some of the order that we're talking about in this example is of the kind that mathematicians and physicists call symmetry. Symmetry plays a central role in modern physics. To a mathematician or a physicist, a symmetry is something that you do. It is a transformation, an action that leaves something looking the same as it did before. So for instance, if you rotate, if you take a perfect square and you rotate it by 90 degrees or any other, mul any multiple of 90 degrees, it looks the same as before. So rotating by 90 degrees is a symmetry of, of the square. Or consider the six gray circles. So here's the hexagonal pattern formed by the ball bearings. Focus on the six light gray circles in the middle. They form a perfect hexagon. If you rotate it by any multiple of 60 degrees, about an axis going through the center, perpendicular to it, it, the, the appearance of the hexagon does not change. Therefore, the hexagon has a rotation, rotating by 60 degrees is a symmetry of the hexagon. The hexagon has six such rotational symmetries, rotating by 60 degrees, 120, 180, 240, 300, 360. This kind of, so mathematicians and physicists say it has a group of symmetries, a symmetry group containing six elements. <coughs> This is the kind of symmetry that one saw in the ball bearings. Now the order that we said was already present in the shapes of the individual ball bearings, even in the apparently chaotic situation before the box was tilted, also involved symmetries. As we saw, the spherical shape of the ball bearings was crucial. Now a sphere also has rotational symmetries, just like a hexagon, but many more of them. Whereas a hexagon has six rotational symmetries, a sphere has an infinite number of them because, because you can rotate a sphere about any axis by any angle, any axis that goes through its center, and any angle, and it looks just the same. So the symmetries of a sphere are much larger. The set of symmetries, the group of symmetries of a sphere, is much larger than the group of symmetries of a hexagon. And indeed, and in fact, the set of symmetries of a sphere includes the symmetries of a hexagon because you can rotate a sphere by a multiple of 60 degrees. The important lesson here is that the hexagonal symmetries that seem to emerge spontaneously out from out of nowhere actually emerged as a consequence of the larger set of symmetries of, built into the situation. 
What happened really was that a small part of the symmetries of a sphere uh, manifested themselves in the hexagonal arrangement. What happened then, okay, actually there's a technical word for that in physics called spontaneous symmetry breaking. It wasn't that symmetry appeared from nowhere. It was symmetry was sort of, that, that, that appeared was a residue of a larger set of symmetry that were broken down. The larger set was broken down to the smaller set of symmetries. They called that, we call that spontaneous symmetry breaking. What happens in the ball bearing in the box example is very similar to what happens when crystals form. The ball bearings were lowering their gravitational energy, which forced, squeezed them down and forced them into a hexagonal pattern. When a liquid is cooled to its freezing point, the atoms or molecules lower what is called their free energy by forming themselves into a regular pattern, into the regular patterns we call crystals. As was the case with the ball bearings, the beautiful symmetries of crystals, and there's a whole area of mathematics on the very rich kinds of crystallographic symmetries. Those symmetries of the crystals are a consequent of symmetries that individual atoms and molecules possess. So here's a picture uh, showing the shapes, so to speak, of a hydrogen atom uh, and what do I mean by that? What's depicted is the probability distributions, distributions of the electron in different states or energy levels of the hydrogen atom. So if one of those things, you know, the, the red, red areas are, the dark areas, the electron is unlikely to be. The red areas, it's more probable that it's there. The white areas, it's even more probable. So these are probability distributions in different states of the hydrogen atom. So you can see there's a lot of symmetry at the atomic level. And the symmetries of at atoms, in turn, can be shown to follow from even richer symmetries and more profound principles of order that exist at the subatomic level. In physics, order at one level is generally found to flow from richer order at the deeper levels. It never emerges just from mere disorder or mere formlessness. Let's consider the order in the heavens, which so impressed the early Christian writers. Much of that order is obvious to anyone and was known, presumably, to prehistoric peoples. We know that it was known to prehistoric peoples. More of that order in the heavens was uncovered by ancient astronomers. And in, mo and in modern times, as scientists studied the motions of the planets with greater precision, they discovered very subtle and unsuspected mathematical patterns even more beautiful than those known to the ancients. For example, four centuries ago, the great astronomer Johannes Kepler discovered three wonderful geometrical and algebraic laws describing the orbits of the planets around the sun. So impressed was he by this mathematical beauty, by the mathematical beauty of these laws, which we nowadays call Kepler's laws of planetary motion, then he wrote this prayer in his great treatise, Harmonices Mundi, the Harm harmonics of the world. I thank you, Lord God, our creator. I quoted this in an earlier talk. I thank thee, Lord God, our creator, that you have allowed me to see the beauty in your work of creation. And by the way, as I said in an earlier talk, that prayer perfectly typifies the attitude of the great figures of the scientific revolution. And long afterwards. A little less than a century after Kepler discovered these beautiful laws of planetary motion, Isaac Newton just showed that they were a consequence of deeper laws, which we call Newton's laws of mechanics and gravity. More than two centuries after that, Einstein showed that Newton's, laws, uh, Newton's law of gravity is an approximation to a yet deeper and more majestic theory of gravity called general relativity. And many leading theorists today suspect, for strong reasons, that Einstein's theory of gravity is in turn an approximation to an even deeper and more remarkable theory called superstring theory. One of the top physicists in the world, I'll be quoting him later, his name is Ed Witten, 
in speaking about superstring theory to a science journalist, said, I don't think I've that I've succeeded in conveying to you. It's wonder, incredible consistency, remarkable elegance, and beauty. Now, one of Kepler's three laws is that the orbits of the planets around the sun are not exact circles, as the ancients believed, but ellipses with the sun at one of the focal points of the ellipse. Ellipses are curves with many elegant mathematical properties, which were much studied by ancient Greek mathematicians. The elliptical shape of planetary orbits can be shown to be a consequence of the fact, discovered by Newton, that the force of gravity obeys an inverse square law, as it's called. This inverse square law, in turn, is a a was later understood to be a consequence of the fact that the gravitational field has a property that's called masslessness. This masslessness, in turn, is a consequence of deep symmetry principles built into Einstein's theory of gravity. So this order, this beautiful pattern of the ellipse, which we can see, at least we trace out the orbit, as you go down to Newton and to Einstein and so on, you find it's built on deeper and deeper principles. It, it didn't, you see this again in, in everywhere in, in physics, everywhere in nature, that the order apparent on the surface can be traced down through deeper and deeper levels. As scientists have penetrated deeper and deeper into nature, they have uncovered mathematical structure and order of ever-increasing subtlety, sophistication, and beauty. For example, well, I, gave this exa I talked about this in my first talk, how Kepler's laws you could explain to a, a middle school or a grade school student, but then for Newton's laws require mathematics, require calculus, and so forth. Einstein's theory of gravity at the deeper level requires vector uh, calculus and uh, actually tensor calculus and differential geometry and curved non-Euclidean four-dimensional space-time and so forth. What's true of the study of the motions of the heavenly bodies is also true of the study of matter itself. As physicists have probed beneath the surface to find the ultimate constituents of matter and the force, ultimate forces by which they interact, they discovered laws uh, that were of astonishing subtlety, governed by mathematical principles and symmetries, much stranger and more sophisticated than any that had been seen before in nature. For example, Einstein's theory of relativity is based on a symmetry. Now, it's a symmetry of the law. You can have symmetries of objects like spheres or, or whatever, oranges. You can have symmetries of equations. It turns out, what Einstein found <clears throat> is that if you do a certain transformation, namely going from one frame of reference to another frame of reference, and one inertial frame to another inertial frame, the equations of physics end up looking the same. And that's a symmetry of the equations of physics. In fact, it turns out that going from one frame of reference to an inertial frame to another inertial frame of reference is a rotation. Not a rotation in space, it's a rotation in space-time. And so what Einstein found is that the laws of physics are symmetric if you do certain rotations in space-time. The equations end up looking the same. That's a, a rotational symmetry. Those kinds of space-time rotations we can't visualize because they involve, whereas rotations in space involve Euclidean geometry that, that we are sort of hardwired, shall we say, by evolution to understand intuitively. These uh, rotations in space-time are call, uh, uh, involve what's called Minkowski, and what, they involve Lorentz transformations, which we do not have any intuition, we don't understand intuitively. That's because we can see space, we don't see time. Um, anyway, so these Lorentz transformations are very strange. They involve um, in fact, whereas ordinary spatial rotations go around in circles, rotations in space-time turn out to go around in hyperbolas. They're very, 
peculiar. Every force of nature it's been discovered, and I can't explain this, it would take a lot of, a, a lot of explanation. Every force of nature that we know of, well, the four except the Higgs force, but the electromagnetism, the weak force, the strong force, and gravity are deeply based on symmetries. Uh, such, and these symmetries got, actually determine to a large extent how these forces work, their structure and properties and so on. Uh, the non-gravitational non forces have what are called gauge symmetries. And they involve rotation. So take, for example, the strong force, uh, one of the forces that holds nuclei together. The strong force is deeply based on a certain, abs a certain <coughs> abstract symmetry that involves rotations in an abstract space, not the space we move around in. An abstract space that has three complex dimensions. What I mean by that, so in mathematics, a comp complex number is a number that contains the square root of minus one, i, which you probably re re learned in school. So complex numbers in involve the square root of minus one. The coordinates in these abstract spaces are complex numbers. And so the rotations in three complex dimensions are involved, sym th those symmetries are involved at, at the heart of the strong, of the strong force. And every force has the, such gauge symmetries. And again, they're symmetries of the equations. Um, it's now believed, though it's not been proven, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence, that the three non-gravitational forces are actually fragments of a deeper <coughs> force called the grand unified force. That's a lot of my research when I was still doing research. About a third of my papers, or maybe a half, were on grand unified theories. Grand unified, there are several grand unified theories. No one knows yet which one is the correct one. They are based on, so the simplest grand unified theory is based on transformations in five complex dimensions. Uh, one can't visualize such things, but you can, you can, there are some diagrams that are connected with these kinds of symmetries in, in a way that I won't explain, but here's some nice patterns that have a, a connection to these symmetries. And I uh, just put them up just to look at. <laughs> <laughs> now there's an inner, indirect evidence that the inner structure of matter involves a certain kind of symmetry that is even stranger called supersymmetry. When you hear about superstring theory, the word super there refers to the fact that built into superstring theory is supersymmetry. The mathematics of supersymmetry uses numbers that are even more remote from our experience than complex numbers. Unlike, unlike either real numbers or complex numbers, both of which satisfy the rule A times B equals B times A, uh, these bizarre so-called Grassmann numbers obey the rule A times B equals minus B times A. Now, even if supersymmetry turns out to be wrong, it has been shown that, there is, that it is a symmetry of nature, the grass, we know that Grassmann numbers need to be used to describe particles such as electrons and quarks. So our laws, the currently known laws of physics, involve not only complex numbers, but these weird Grassmann numbers. So far, I've, I've emphasized a particular kind of ordering principle called symmetry, and it's very important in, in, in modern physics. But symmetry principles are not the only kind of pr ordering principles in nature. In, they are even more important. There are dynamical principles, such as those, for example, those of quantum mechanics, which govern how things move and change. These two are of great mathematical sophistication and subtlety. So, returning to the ball bearings in the box example for a moment, remember that I said that there was a physical principle that made the ball bearings settle into the configuration that had the lowest gravitational energy. This follows from more, a more general organizing principle of nature called the principle of least action, which was discovered gradually from the 1700s in, into the 1800s, a series of brilliant physicists and mathematicians 
realize that all of physics, all of physics was based on a, on a fundamental principle called the principle of least action. In the 20th century, it was discovered, so situations of lowest energy are stable. That really comes from a deeper principle, the principle of least action. In the 20th century, quantum mechanics was discovered, and it turned out that the principle of least action is really just an approximation to a deeper, more fundamental, and more subtle principle called the path integral principle. So to summarize everything I've said, science does not explain away the order seen in nature, but always explains order at one <coughs> level as coming from a deeper level. Now, what happens when we come to the very deepest levels of physical reality? And I think everybody in my field of particle physics, and I don't know everybody, but I think if you were to poll them, you'd find the overwhelming majority of them, believe that there is a deepest level of physics. There are, you know, you go from <coughs> Kepler's laws, Newton's laws, Einstein's laws, eventually you're going to hit the laws of physics, the fundamental laws of physics below which there is no deeper level, the bedrock laws of physics. What happens when you get to that level? We expect that the, this mathematical structure and order will be very prof profound and impressive. In fact, we may already know what the laws at that level are. They might be superstring theory. Now, science cannot explain that order in terms of an underlying <coughs> order at a deeper level, because there is no deeper level to nature. So why is it there? And all, virtually all physicists in my field are convinced that when we get to that deepest level, if we're not already there, we're going to see remarkable order. Why is it there? So to repeat the question asked by, say, Gregory of Nazianzus in the late fourth century, oh, so here we go, the deeper, the more impressive the order we the order at the level of phenomena arises from deeper and more abstract order at the laws of physics, and the laws are based on deeper laws. And you so to repeat the question asked by St. Gregory, let us even suppose that the existence of the world is spontaneous. To what will you ascribe its order? This is a question that goes beyond the kinds of explanations science can give. Why is there any order at all? And in particular, why, what counts for the order at the deepest levels of nature? Now, you could say that, that this astonishing order is just a brute fact. It's there. Get used to it. Okay? It's just the way things are. Or one can say that the order comes from a giver of order, that the profound ideas come from a profound mind, and that the fundamental laws come from a lawgiver. That's what the theist says. What does the atheist say? The atheist has no answer. I have never come across, I don't think in the entire history of thought, have atheists ever given any plausible or even any explanation of why the world has order at all. So for them, it must be a brute fact. Maybe they're right, hypothetically. Maybe that there is no answer to the question. But the only people who have an answer are the theists. Now, I'd like to end with some quotes from some eminent modern scientists. The first quote I already gave in my first talk by Hermann Weil, he was religious. The second and third quotes are from agnostics. And I want you to notice is they are deeply impressed, and how deeply they are impressed, by the very same things about the universe that so impressed the early Christian writers that I quoted at the beginning, harmony, order, law, and beauty, and they use the same words. So the first quote I already gave you, well, I gave you the longer quote, from Hermann Weil, one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century. Many people think that modern science is far removed from God, but I find, on the contrary, that in our knowledge of physical nature, we have penetrated so far that we obtain can obtain a vision of the flawless harmony, which is in conformity with sublime reason. The next quote is from an eminent astrophysicist at Harvard. Uh, Karen Oberg knows him pretty well. Oberg was giving an interview to a journalist 
And the journalists thought that some of the things Loeb was saying were kind of weird. So the journalists thought maybe, maybe Loeb is, a, is, a, is religious. Because if he has some weird ideas, he must be religious. <laughs> so Loeb actually is not religious. And he answered, I was secular to start with. No, he said, I was secular to start with. I am not religious. But I am struck by the order we find in the universe, by the regularity, by the existence of laws of nature. That's something I'm always in awe of, how the laws of nature we find here on Earth seem to apply all the way out to the edge of the universe. That's quite remarkable. The universe could have been very chaotic and very disorganized, but it obeys a set of laws much better than people obey a set of laws here. <laughs> By the way, I was, I, was, I, was, I was looking over my talk this morning, it occurred to me, Father Terry gave a very great sermon, up, a homily up at our uh, Society of Catholic Scientists conference uh, uh, about 10 days ago. And, with, and he's talking about how all of creation you know, praises its creator. That's many theologians. All of creation, actually you're going to see a, a movie later this week, All Creation Gives Praise. Well, one way that creation gives praise to its creator is by obeying him. <laughs> all those little particles and all those little plants and animals and galaxies and stars obey the laws of God. Much better than we obey them here on earth, as Loeb says. That's one way they show worship their creator, is by obeying his commandments. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. <laughs> the third quote is from Ed Witten regarded by many people in my field as the most brilliant person in my field, and probably the most, just the, as far as intellectual wattage, the most brilliant <laughs> physicist of the last two generations, perhaps. He, also, he described himself to an, up to an, an interview as a skeptical agnostic. He was asked if he believed in God. But he said the following about the laws of physics. The laws of nature, as they've been uncovered in the last few centuries, and especially in the last century, are very surprising. They're very subtle. They've got a great beauty, which is a little hard to describe, maybe, if one hasn't experienced it. The laws, as we know them, are very beautiful mathematically. They involve very interesting and subtle concepts. It is a rich story, and it all hangs together beautifully. A little repetitive. But notice, the world is based on subtle and beautiful concepts. A concept sort of suggests a mind at work. And so he, though he is a skeptical, a skeptical agnostic, he is not far from, he is certainly appreciating the same things that the early Christian writers uh, were impressed by, and for, which for them and for us, point to God. Thank you.